Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, good evening, uh, Professor Bishop. Yes, hello. Yeah, hello. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Your background is a little too dark. Is that a little better? Okay, this is better. Yeah, it's, it's much better now. Yeah. So what time is it right now? About 9.28. Actually, I'm going to change my background if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Uh, should there be time for questions or we're just going to go through? No, we will have time for questions. And I believe, uh, yeah, before that, a warm welcome to the ISHMT conference, uh, the Indian Society for Heat and Mass Transfer Conference in India. And thanks a lot for, uh, you know, agreeing to give the keynote talk. Yeah. So we will have questions. We will have time for some questions. But what is the, your planned presentation time? Uh, well, I thought I had about 20 minutes or uh, 30 minutes, right? Yes, you can certainly take about 35 minutes. That's no problem. Okay. Okay. So, um, so I have your bio that was shared and I'm going to read that out. Is, do you have anything adi in addition to it or that should be fine? I'm sure that's fine. That's fine. Okay. All right. Thanks. So we'll start in about a few minutes. Sure. Uh, Praveen, you can let us know when to get started. We have about a minute for nine o'clock. Sure, sir. I think we can start now, sir. It's nine a.m. It's it's nine. Yes, okay. Sir. Um. So good evening. Uh, to uh, good evening, Professor Bishop, and also good morning to all the audience of this particular session, ISHMT uh, 2021. And, and uh, it's a nice warm Monday morning out here in India. And uh, so we have the first keynote by Professor John Bishop from uh, University of uh, Minnesota. So to introduce the speaker to you, the Professor Bishop works in the area of thermal engineering with a focus on biopreservation, thermal therapy, and nanomedicine. His awards include the ASME Van Mau Medal and fellowships in societies including cryobiology, JSPS, ASME, and AIMBE. He has served as the president of the of the Society for Cryobiology and the chair uh, and the chair of the bioengineering division of the ASME. Bischoff obtained a BS in mechanic uh, in bioengineering from UC Berkeley in 1987, an MS from UC Berkeley and also from UC San Francisco in 1989, and a PhD in mechanical engineering from UC Berkeley in 1992. After a postdoctoral fellowship at the Harvard in the in the Center for Engineering and Medicine, he joined the faculty of Minnesota in 1993. Bischoff is now a distinguished McKnight University professor and a Crew Mayor uh, Chair in the Departments of Mechanical and Bioengineering, and the Medtronic Bakken Down Chair, also the Director of the Institute for Engineering and Medicine at the University of Minnesota, and the Director of the new NSF Engineering Research Center, ATP Bio. So let's give a warm welcome to Professor Bischoff. And uh, today's talk, what Professor Bischoff is going to present is on bioheat transfer and biopreservation. It's a new emerging area, and I hope that all of you would like the presentation from Professor Bischoff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I share my screen? Is that all right? Yes, please go ahead. Can everybody see this okay? We are able to see your screen. I th okay. think uh, I would just request from the presentation desk are you able to see it in full screen? Yes, sir. Okay. We are ready to go, Professor Bishop. Okay, great. Well, thank you, uh, Pramod, and the organizers for the invitation to speak to you about bioheat transfer and biopreservation, and also to introduce our new Gen 4 
NSF Engineering Research Center for the Advanced Technologies for the Preservation of Biological Systems. Uh, this is actually a collaboration between Minnesota, UC Berkeley, Massachusetts General Hospital, UC Riverside, and also Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I am just disclosing that I'm actually working uh, on spinning out some of this technology in a company called Vitrastore, and this is being handled uh, through my uh, university in terms of conflict of interest. So I'll start with a vision <coughs> uh, of what this ERC actually represents. So uh, what the ERCs, all of them need to uh, not only have engineering in them, embedded in them, but also show how the engineering is going to lead to societal benefit. So in our case, this wheel that you see gives you examples of the various applications uh, which will allow, uh, which we will uh, be impacting with our different technologies. So at the top, you see cell therapies. These cells, these are really going to be the drugs of tomorrow, stem cells, CAR T cells, uh, islets. These all require banking to increase pain, uh, patient access. Uh, in the upper right, transplantable tissues and organs. So we're trying to get the right organ and tissue to the right person at the right time. This will increase matching and uh, immune tolerance and also turn transplant surgery into a day job. In terms of drug discovery, it costs over $2 billion per drug in the US. And so what we'd like to do is with better cell and tissue models for testing, we should be able to shrink the cost and improve drug testing to get better drugs out sooner to the market and to the patients that need them. In terms of vertebrate model systems, there are many genetic model systems such as zebrafish and Drosophila, Xenopus, and mice. And what we'd like to be able to do is to bank these transgenic lines that are being used increasingly in genome engineering and stabilize these important disease models uh, to allow us to do better job uh, understanding the genesis of disease and the, uh, uh, how to uh, basically therapeutically fix them uh, in these different important model systems. We can also use how we understand these vertebrate models and apply that to different ecosystems in the world to try to bank uh, and, and save some of these ecosystems that are being impacted by climate change. So as an example, Svalbard in Norway banks seeds for plants, but there is no such repository for fauna. So there are, there's no place for where, where animals are uh, being stored. And so this is a goal of our, of our uh, group. We also want to try to feed the world sustainably. And so uh, and as an example, aquaculture is a growing source of protein in the world. And if we were able to actually create what we call cryo seed, so you have fish, for instance, that might breed seasonally, if we could actually bank those embryos and bring them out and grow them, uh, let's say once a month or whatever uh, would be needed for an aquaculture facility, you could greatly expand <coughs> how uh, fish is grown and used and, and uh, for, for uh, feed. And an example of that, there's a salmon uh, recirculating aqua, uh, aquaculture facility about two hours from my house here in Minnesota, if they had this cryo seed capability for salmon, they could actually increase their productivity and create just in that one recirculating facility, one sixth of all the salmon eaten uh, in the United States. So it's a huge opportunity. Uh, also, we want to bank skin and biological dressings for use in mass casualty events. And uh, there was a volcanic eruption in New Zealand and they ran out of skin to actually treat some of these uh, poor pa uh, patients that came. Uh, this is also a common occurrence in, in fire and other uh, catastrophic uh, injuries events. And so uh, being able to bank that and use it all over the world would be a benefit. And finally, we're looking at ways to stabilize uh, and improve trauma and battlefield injury through different types of um, basically hibernation approaches. So all of these are the societal impacts that we hope to achieve through our ERC. 
And the really the big idea <clears throat> is to address what you see in the sort of the orange boxes. The green box is where you isolate cells and tissues from uh, you know, organisms such as fish or pigs, large animals, and even from humans. The isolation and use for tissue engineering is, is well known and it's done at the lab scale. And we can also in the green box in the middle there, culture and tissue engineer and genetically engineer those systems. But if you look over in the blue, those blue boxes are the ones that we just talked about in terms of societal benefit. There is a supply chain management issue in terms of scaling up, storing, shipping, uh, transporting those uh, biomedical products out for use by society. And that is really what we are addressing through our Gen 4 ERC. So the evolution of this work is really spans almost 10 years back and, and really much, much further if you think about the Society of Crowd Biology. Uh, and the Society of Crowd Biology has been focused on preservation for over 50 years. Uh, we had our 50th anniversary in 2013, and then we had a lot of uh, road mapping, networking, and uh, uh, consensus building that you can see below the blue line. Um, and we actually have a consensus article that I would encourage anybody who finds this interesting to read that was actually in bio, Nature Biotechnology in 2017. Uh, there were over 40 authors on it, and it really creates a roadmap document for what is, we are trying to do, uh, especially in the tissue and organ space. Above the blue line, you can see some of the platform technologies beginning to evolve out of the different labs and at the different institutions that are part of the ERC. And so this is actually bookended by some really compelling work that's coming out of Massachusetts General Hospital. And you can see that they've been able to super cool and preserve livers from rodents for greater than four days back even in 2013 and 2014. And then uh, at the far end there in 2019, they actually supercooled a whole human liver. And so this is really uh, exciting because they were able to extend the preservation time of that whole human liver by over three times from eight hours to over 24 hours. Uh, in between, you see a number of different technologies that have been developed. Isochoric preservation, which is a way of basically uh, maintaining the volume of your system so that ice, which we know will actually change phase and um, uh, actually reduces, uh, it actually grows in volume as it, as it changes phase. Uh, by having an isochoric or isovolumetric container, you reduce the ability of, of the system to actually change phase. So that's been used in Berkeley on C. elegans and other biomedical products. Uh, we at Minnesota focused on plasmonic and radio frequency rewarming using uh, plasmonic nanoparticles and radio frequency or magnetic nanoparticle rewarming that's been published uh, for both zebrafish embryos as well as for now vascular and, and organ systems. And then the other approaches that have been used on, on different organismal systems as well. So this is sort of the evolution in the creation of these different platform technologies, which I'll tell you more about, and some of the consensus building that you can see in terms of roadmap documents and summits that have really brought this, this group together that I'll tell you more about. So the platform technologies are shown here, and really what you see on the y-axis is temperature and the storage duration that we can achieve on the x-axis. And the really, the, the goal in reducing the temperature is to reduce uh, the metabolism. If we can reduce the metabolism, then you can essentially store indefinitely. And that's really what you see in the bottom right, which is vitrification or storing in a glass. Uh, what we do today though, with, uh, as you see on the upper right, you know, we put organs in boxes with ice basically. So that's hypothermic preservation. And that's really a matter of hours, not days. With supercooling, which is what the MGH, Massachusetts General Hospital Group, is working on, we can actually supercool and go out uh, all the way to now days. And when we think about going to partially frozen systems, uh, that actually can give us maybe weeks or even months. And that is actually a nature-inspired solution 
from a frog called Rana sylvatica, or the wood frog, which can survive with up to 65% of its water in the frozen state. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And finally, in the uh, lowest temperature range below uh, minus 100, we can actually achieve a glassy phase and we can actually store organs and, and return them from that state. And all of this we're doing by manipulating the temperature pressure and con concentration of these different systems to depress this metabolism. So that's where the engineering really comes in to achieving this state of suspended animation. So one way of you know, visualizing this is to look at it from the point of view of a phase diagram. And so you see temperature again on the y-axis and concentration on the x-axis. The concentration is of what we will call uh, cryoprotective agents. These are biological antifreeze molecules. So just like you would put, at least in Minnesota, we put uh, cryoprotectants, you know, polyethylene glycol and things like this into our cars. This can actually also be done with biological systems. And so uh, you see the, the bear above the, the liquidus there, and the bear is actually hibernating. And below the liquidus, you can see all these different natural systems that actually can survive with ice, including the Rana Sylvatica there in the lower left, uh, or I'm sorry, the lower right and even an Antarctic cod that can swim around with nucleated ice in its bloodstream. Uh, all, if you move over to even higher concentrations of crab protective agents, you can see that there are uh, what are called tardigrades or water bears, artemia cysts, as well as Antarctic nematodes. They all can survive in the glassy phase. And I'm just gonna play this video. This video is of Rana Sylvatica, and this is Ken Story, who works in Ottawa and is actually collaborating with our ERC. Their, their limbs can't be moved, they would be broken off. They're completely frozen. If they're still alive. And he's taken them out of the freezer. But the most amazing thing is the fact that the wood frog comes back to life. Over a couple of hours, it makes a miraculous and complete so I uh, would encourage you to find more information about this Rana Sabatica or watch some of Ken Story's work if you're interested in this. But the fact that a whole organism can survive in the frozen state is really inspirational to this whole ERC. And we are following this as a nature inspired uh, solution. So we're bringing together both engineering and science, and we're trying to address these overarching challenges. So they are excessive ice formation, toxicity from adding too much of those molecules in the wrong way to our systems, and actually uh, thermal and mechanical stress, particularly uh, the thermal stress when the middle and the edge of your system are experiencing different temperature regimes on the cooling or the rewarming, you can have thermal stress that will crack your system. Uh, so Basically, the engineering then is blended with the science, the molecular biology, chemistry, regenerative medicine, surgery, all come together along with the traditional engineering, which um, many of you here at this, um, uh, at, the, at this conference know so well about. So these are some of the faculty, and they are from, as I mentioned, five different institutions, as well as some collaborating institutions such as Ken Story and Carleton. Uh, and we have groups that are working on test beds, which I'll tell you about. These are biological test beds. We also have uh, what we call a broader impacts in National Science Foundation in workshop, uh, excuse me, work workforce development, innovation, ethics, and uh, culture of inclusion. And then we have our faculty there in different thrust areas. This is over 30 faculty and 11 cryobiologists that are in engineering and three in biology. So our overarching uh, goal here is really uh, to hit these milestones. And we have three thrust areas. And very simply put, we have uh, a thrust. The first thrust is to biologically engineer the system so that it can actually go into a state of suspended animation, whether it's supercooling, partial freezing, or vitrification. And that really has a lot to do with cryoprotective agents these biological antifreeze molecules. 
The second thrust area is about multiscale thermodynamics of water. So how do we control the phase of the water, either being super cool, partially frozen, or vitrified? And then the third is how do we come back from that suspended animation? How do we do it in such a way that the uh, we won't crack it, we won't crystallize our system and kill it? And if we can do all those things and hit all of these milestones that you see here, and I'm not going to walk through every single one of them, we can then hit uh, those blue boxes on the right, which are our societal benefits. So this is the overarching uh, approach. What I can show you here is, uh, this is called the three-tier diagram, and this is something that every ERC uh, needs to develop. And it really starts with, you know, fundamental uh, technology in the, in, the, in the bottom part of this three-tier diagram. Then you see our three thrust, which I've already introduced to you. And at the highest level here, these are our test beds. They're non-traditional test beds from an engineering point of view, because these are biologically viable systems that are anywhere from cells to what we call microphysiological systems or tissues to whole organs and even organisms such as the zebrafish. And they interact, this research, con convergent research part of the ERC interacts with our innovation ecosystem, which actually contains in it education and culture of inclusion, workforce development, and ethics and policy and even regulation associated with how these new technologies will be regulated and then adopted by society. So uh, we have to integrate these pillars and this gives you some sense of how we're trying to do that. Engineering workforce development, diversity, research and innovation are the green pillars. To that we've added an integration uh, group that basically focuses on the red cross cutting aspects of this that you can see. And we've added ethics, which is a new uh, approach that is now being also added to other ERCs. And the ethics and regulation really help us bring everything together. Um, so I'll just say a few words here about our convergent research and introduce you to a couple of our pillars. Uh, this is run by my deputy director, Mehmet Toner at MGH, as well as with uh, our program manager, Jenny Nesbitt. So our system-wide test beds are, as I mentioned, cells, so clinically relevant cells like uh, natural killer cells, T cells, um, stem cells, as well as pancreatic islets. Microphysiological systems would be maybe cardiac, you know, beating small cardiac chips so that you don't have to actually sacrifice an animal to get an understanding of how uh, a heart cell or a heart tissue might react to, let's say, a drug. Uh, liver microphysiological system, uh, whole organs. We have ways of doing transplants on organs, studying organs as they're inside of animals, but we can also study them outside of animals and do higher throughput work at rodents before we begin to work in larger animal systems and eventually hopefully get into clinical trials. And finally, organisms. Uh, zebrafish is our first organism of choice. But we've started to work on Cryptosporidium, Drosophila, Pacific white shrimp, which is an, aqua, uh, an aquaculture species uh, that we're interested in. <clears throat> so this gives you some idea of the different test beds that we're working on. These are all supported by sensors and metrics, as you can see on the bottom, 3 omega, which is something we know well in the thermal uh, science community, evolutionary algorithms to figure out what cryoprotective agents to use when and how to introduce them, thermal mapping of the behavior of these systems as we cool and warm them and metabolic sensors to see functionally how they behave after. And each one of these test beds connects to a distinct market segment, which is very interesting. And I'll say more about that a little bit later. <clears throat> so uh, very briefly, I'll, I'll give you some examples of these different thrusts. So in the biological engineering thrust, which is again, the one where we are focusing on how to actually prepare the biological system, those test beds that I just showed you. How do we make sure that they will be prepared to go into this suspended animation? Korkut Uygen and Martin Yarmish at MGH are leading this. And we work at the molecular, the genetic cellular, as well as the whole tissue and organ level. And a lot of this has to do with 
uh, how we can create and then deliver non-toxic cryoprotective agents, non-toxic not only in their structure, but also in the concentration and the temperature and the way in which we would add and then later take away these cryoprotective agents from uh, these different systems. So just as an example, uh, we can work at the level of genetic engineering. So we can engineer the cryoprotective agents such as triolose or create a glucose analog that cannot be metabolized. And these things can then be taken up by the cell and used. Um, metal activated pores allow the triolose to actually get into the cells. And we can actually then also do biomimetics. So we would take from some of these nature inspired cases where they have recrystallization inhibitors like the Antarctic cod, and we can create new ones using computational chemistry, which will actually reduce the amount of recrystallization, uh, recrystallization inside of cells and thereby keep them alive in the presence of ice. We can create semi-permeable microbeads so that we can actually uh, both deliver as well as remove crab protective agents uh, during and after the uh, phase change event. And then we can control how the system will actually respond to these crab protective agents using metabolic control. Uh, we actually then can use things like dynamic discriminant analysis, as well as the fatty chip, uh, I'm sorry, the liver chip to look at fatty liver uh, tissue as a, as a test bed to study cryoprotective agent toxicity. You can see low and high toxicity depending on how you present the cryoprotective agent to these systems. We can then also be inspired from nature. So the Arctic ground squirrel can actually super cool dramatically and still survive. So we can use uh, similar technology or um, we, we create technologies to recapitulate that as well as the wood frog, which I've shown to you. Uh, we can actually do multithermic mach machine perfusion to create what actually the Rana Slavotic wood frog is going through. And we can make uh, the, the liver go through a very similar system. And that is in fact what the MGH system uh, group is doing at, at the moment. In thrust two, we're actually controlling the thermodynamics of water. So this is where we decide how much of the system do we want to actually have change phase into uh, crystals or whether we want to actually go to an amorphous state. And so again, we're trying to work between supercooling, partially frozen, or actually being in a glassy state. And we can actually use one more variable, which is pressure using isochoric cooling to manipulate uh, between all of these systems. So a couple of examples uh, at the organism and organ level, uh, we've been able to preserve now. Uh, the, this is the first robust protocol uh, that has uh, been published in you know, decades for Drosophila embryos. And we've shown that we can actually preserve uh, 25 different strains of Drosophila flies and successfully bring them back. This was published in Nature Communications. And it's really, um, it's all about how the cryoprotective agents are delivered and then how quickly we can actually cool and rewarm to avoid crystals in these systems. We can look at supercooling for liver storage, which is a multithermic uh, approach where we're basically trying to turn uh, rodent and human livers into basically the rana savatic or a wood frog liver uh, with some success. So we're getting rat livers out to many days and human livers out to 27 hours, which again uh, is good enough that we're talking about going into clinical trials for this because it's so much better than what we have presently. Uh, in terms of cell and tissue highlights, we also have deep supercooling. So we can go down to minus 13 or minus 16 for up to seven days with high cell viability. The trick here is to take away the heterogeneous nucleation sites by using an immiscible oil phase at the, uh, the interface with the atmosphere. Uh, we also have been doing isochoric preservation with cardiac systems uh, and showing some uh, dramatic increase in the ability to remain in a supercooled state. This is Kevin Healy working with Boris Rubinsky. In terms of the, the last thrust, which is rapid and uniform rewarming, uh, Guillermo Aguilar, who is now the department head at Texas A&M, uh, moved from UC Riverside and uh, myself, we work on this together. 
And it's basically trying to figure out how to uh, the warm droplets and tissue systems all the way up to organ systems. So it's really a scale problem. How do you do that as fast and as uniformly as possible so that you can bring these uh, cryopreserved systems from thrust two back so that they are viable and functional? And as you see over here, the scale in terms of you know, microliter, milliliter, or liter, as you go up in scale, the amount of cryoprotective agent that you need to use goes up and your, uh, your critical warming rates actually go in the opposite direction. So as you use a less cryoprotective agent, you need to travel faster when you're trying to warm. So even in the millions of degrees C per minute. So we achieve that through plasmonically active nanoparticles for very small systems and radio, uh, radio frequency activated uh, magnetic nanoparticles for some of the larger leader scale systems. And I'll tell you a few uh, more things about that. So this is an example of laser nanowarming. And this is the protocol. This is the first protocol ever to bring a fish embryo back to life. And it's one that the aquaculture industry is very interested in, as well as folks working in biodiversity and ecosystem management. And we're actually using microinjection to inject plasmonic gold nanoparticles directly into these embryos. The reason why people can't bring them back using conventional approaches is that they're almost a millimeter in diameter. Uh, for uh, comparison, you can think of either, uh, well, most mammalian oocytes are only about 100 microns, and they can be successfully, many of them, not all, but some can be uh, successfully cryopreserved. Because this is one millimeter, it's basically a thousand times larger in volume, and it has multi-compartments with very uh, poorly permeable membranes. And so that's why we need to actually inject the cryoprotective agent. We can't diffusively load it. And we have to then, on rewarming, uh, we can't rewarm it from the outside convectively. We have to do it from inside with a heat generation term, which is where we're using these plasmonic nanoparticles. We can rapidly cool and cryo storage uh, basically with uh, vitrification. And that is uh, something that has been done in the past even. Uh, but now for the first time, we can bring them back uh, fast and uniformly with a plasmonic pulse of a millisecond laser that then um, will heat up these gold nanorods and thereby heat up the entire uh, embryo. So we've been able to show we can bring them back. It's not extremely high uh, percentages in the viability, but we have brought uh, you know, these fish back and a number of them are actually mating and living out uh, their lives relatively normally, multiple mating, and there's no difference from control. So we're also using the same technology on mammalian systems like stem cells, coral larvae. This is a collaboration with the Smithsonian where we're trying to do uh, coral management and ecosystem, um, uh, basically preservation, as well as working with Pacific white shrimp and brine shrimp. Uh, the Pacific white is an aquaculture species. So a lot of very uh, important systems that we can begin to think about banking and biorepositories for this. And then in the uh, larger scale systems like organs, we're using iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles, not plasmonic, uh, plasmonic gold. And we need to start paying attention to the chemistry. So you can see here over on the left, this is uh, Ferrotech EMG 308. If we perf perfuse that directly into an organ, you can see it's getting plugged up. Uh, we believe that's primarily in the glomerulus and the vasculature there. If we then create a, a formulation that's more colloidally stable, you can see that it's moving throughout the organ system and it maintains its ability to heat. And we have been able to show that we can successfully bring back uh, kidneys and hearts physically from the vitrified system uh, with this. And we're also working on livers. So it's very exciting and we're scaling this. Uh, we're also using improved nanoparticles so we don't have to use as many. If they heat better, we can use less of them. So a, a lesser concentration. And we now have our preliminary results showing that we can do this not only in small coils and medium coils of 80 milliliters, so rodent systems, but 
we have a new system at Minnesota that's been installed and we are working on porcine level organs like porcine kidney. And soon we hope we'll be working on human systems that are not yet being, those organs that we will work on will not be used for um, transplantation, but for research. And we hope to be doing that sometime soon. So in summary, uh, this is our uh, research interactome. And it basically is showing you uh, how we are working between these different thrust areas. We have different metrics, sensors, and technologies. And uh, we are working to basically preserve these different test beds uh, for societal benefit. And I think maybe my time is probably up and I'd be happy to take uh, any questions. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Bischoff. I think it was a fantastic presentation. We have uh, a couple of minutes for some questions from the audience. Um, I would like to see. Yeah, um, I don't see any questions posted as of now, unless I'm missing something. From the volunteer desk, is are there any questions that have been posted? Uh, no, sir. Actually, there is one minute lag between portal and Zoom session, so maybe we can wait for a minute. Sure. So while that portal opens for questions. So Professor Bischoff, uh, can I go ahead and ask you a couple of questions? Yes, of course. And I'd also be happy to tell you more about some of our different pieces of the ERC, if that would be interesting, like the engineering workforce development and culture of inclusion. I can sure. get some words about that as well. Sure, why don't you go ahead and do that while we open up for questions? And then I have a few questions towards the end. Yeah, great. Um, why don't I do this quickly then? So our engineering workforce development is another pillar, not just convergent research, but we, we also have workforce development, diversity, culture of inclusion, and innovation ecosystem, as well as ethics. And so here the goal is to improve the quantity and quality of the engineering workforce and to diversify the workforce to be representative of the, de uh, the demographics of the United States. And so we are working at K through 12. Uh, we're also working at the undergraduate and the graduate level. And we have uh, folks all the way, uh, you know, across all of the institutions that are participating. <clears throat> this is actually led by Jillian Rorig. And what I think is important to note is, you know, Jill is not an engineer, uh, but she's working with engineers. So she's actually a professor of science education and she works with uh, you know, teachers basically that are in middle school trying to maintain the interest of young girls as well as young boys. So there's a, there's a point in middle school where the boys stay interested in STEM and the girls don't. And so we're trying to actually take information from our ERC and give interesting case studies and, and uh, ideas back to K through 12 to keep those, uh, those, those students interested. Um, and we're also working to diversify both the graduate and the, uh, uh, and the undergraduate. And part of uh, uh, that comes through diversity and culture of inclusion, which is led by Keisha Varma, who's our Associate Vice Provost for Equity and Inclusion. And the reason why we want to do this, uh, if you look, uh, this is actually in terms of the uh, University of Minnesota, UC Riverside and Berkeley Engineering. If you look at the um, diverse student population, you can see that our, our diversity numbers are far below that of UC Riverside. Berkeley also is a bit below. And so we are trying to actively engage with uh, historically black colleges and universities, as well as historic um, Hispanic serving institutions to try to really uh, create a more diverse student population at Minnesota and, and elsewhere. Um, and then finally, uh, on ethics and public policy, this is actually Susan Wolf. She is a uh, professor of law and also a regents professor. And she also has a, an appointment in our medical school. And she works with Tim Pruitt, who's a professor of surgery. So he stands to benefit if we can ever crowd preserve an organ. He 
knows uh, a fair bit about this because he's the past president of one of the organ procurement and transplant networks for the world. Uh, and so um, together they are thinking about how to regulate this and think about case studies. Here you see a couple of examples, you know, with solid organs. Um, would we actually be able to end organ shortages uh, if we, with these technologies? Can we, can we promote equitable access? Uh, is, there, is there a risk? Because, you know, we, we have transplant, uh, you know, programs in the United States, but it, it's not, uh, you know, in some parts of Africa and some parts of the world, there aren't transplant programs. So is there a, uh, a situation where there might be exploitation, harvest in low-income countries use for use in high income? This would have to be, you know, we have to look at that very carefully and make sure that doesn't happen. And then with biodiversity, you know, can we aid in coral and aquatic or other ecosystem conservation and also promote food security? And are there risks of these biorepositories? Uh, what, what if we, for instance, use it for the wrong purposes and we're, um, you know, we're preserving things that shouldn't be preserved? And then what rules should guide those technologies? So lots of very important questions that need to be addressed in terms of uh, best use cases and regulation. And then finally, uh, there is an innovation ecosystem with all this new technology coming out, you know, where will it be adopted? Who will adopt it? How will it make it out for societal benefit? And that really requires us to work with companies. And so we uh, have, you know, a very long list. We're very lucky to have such a long list of potential partners and candidates that we can work with. And these are all people that wrote letters in support of this. And a fair number of these folks have now signed on as official partners. But it really breaks down into a couple of different areas. So you have sort of the established uh, companies like Medtronic, Boston Scientific, LexCoSmithKline, and so on. And then you have a lot of little startups. So Silvatica, uh, you know, uh, Cryocyte, Panthera, these are all kind of smaller companies that are working in this area that are ex therma, trying to build out and, and take advantage of this sort of what is becoming a hot field and, and lots of startup. And then you have a fair bit of companies that are in the tissue and organ space. So you can see a lot of the what are called organ procurement uh, companies. Are, are really part of this now uh, or, or becoming part of it live on New York. Uh, One Legacy, um, Canadian uh, Donation and, and Transplantation Research Program, Life Source, all of these are, are, are groups that work with human cells and tissues and organs. Uh, and then finally, other, which is you know, a bit of everything, including uh, Minnesota Sea Grant, Teal and Generator of Venture Capital, and, and also some, some uh, philanthropic groups. So we're very lucky to have such a rich group to work with to help us actually uh, translate these technologies out. And I'll just actually stop maybe here by saying we're also, uh, you know, Ernie Cravallo passed away this last year and uh, he is, um, he was, he worked with Cheng Lin Tian. So he's really embedded in our heat and mass transfer community and he was an MIT professor. He trained a lot of uh, very famous professors, including Ken Diller, who was uh, both the department head of biomedical engineering and mechanical engineering at Texas Austin, John McGrath, who worked at uh, Arizona and Michigan State, as well as the NSF, Boris Rubinsky, who's at Berkeley, Allison Hubble, who's at uh, Minnesota and is the incoming president of the Society of Crop Biology, and Mehmet Toner, who's my deputy director for uh, the ATB bio. Uh, so there will be an ASME journal of heat transfer special issue coming out to honor uh, Ernie this year. And uh, with that, uh, thank you. And uh, maybe now is a good time to take some of those questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, I don't see, I don't see too many questions posted, but um, I just go ahead. We have about three or four minutes left. So sure. one, one question that, you know, it always intrigued me was, what about the constitutive relations that you use for human tissues or anything? 
See, we need to know the thermal conductivity, the density, and these vary between uh, organs to organs. So how do you determine the freezing rates and the thawing rates? Yeah, so this is a really good point. I mean, biological systems are not like inorganic systems, so we can't just go to our undergraduate heat transfer textbooks and go and look up and, uh, you know, get those, those uh, parameters and properties. Um, increasingly, there have been measurements that have been made that are showing up in the literature. So if you Google, you know, around, go to Google Scholar and so on, you'll see that there are uh, compendiums and reviews and also very nice con uh, contributed articles in that area. Mm -hmm. And also um, ASME and the Society for Thermal Medicine in the United States in collaboration with the FDA and some other entities, they're actually putting together what they're calling a lexicon to actually um, basically tabulate all of these different parameters in these, uh, you know, the properties, the thermal properties in different organ systems. And so if you like, I mean, I'd be happy to give you the links to all of that. Yeah. And, and there's, there's also a foundation in Switzerland that's trying to do a comprehensive uh, database for this. It's, it's not quite comprehensive, but it's the ILTIS Foundation. Uh, and I, I found that that is a, a reasonable place to go for some, some things. Okay, but will it also vary demographically? Like for example, an African-American would have uh, tissues or the liver with the different constitutive uh, properties compared to, uh, you know, why? I don't think, yeah, I, okay. So I don't think that there've been enough studies that have been done across all populations to answer that question definitively. But um, my, my guess is that the thermal properties are going to be relatively consistent ac across, uh, you know, different, different races and so on. I think it might be more, um, you know, uh, you know, what is, you know, are, are, do you, do you work out? Are you, are you, you know, are you obese? Are you thin? You know, mm -hmm. those things will make a difference because if you have more fat versus more muscle and things like that, those things will come into play in terms of changing, uh, you know, your, your, the properties of your particular system. Age also will be important. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop here my questions and I'll probably presume in a minute or so. We have one question from uh, by Harish. He says, thanks for the wonderful talk. Can a malfunction kidney be restored and transplanted? That's a really good question. Uh, there's a new company that's been around now for a little while, and this is all the rage. Uh, you know, people are spending a lot of time thinking about this. Uh, the company's name is Transmedics, and it, it's in Boston. And the concept of the company is to take an organ that is what they call extended criteria, or basically one that they would not normally transplant. They put it on this Transmedics device, and they basically resuscitate the organ. Uh, and so they have shown some really dramatic data that suggests that they can resuscitate some organs. They can't resuscitate all organs, but maybe, uh, you know, to your question, you know, it depends on your malfunctioned kidney, uh, how, how, how malfunctioned it is. You know, it, it's possible. It's also possible that more organs will be used for transplant because of this resuscitation technology, which is running in parallel to some of the things that I talked about. And indeed, we are thinking about, okay, after you do crowd preservation, this is actually a stress on the kidney, you know, it's a, or whatever organ you're working with. So the crowd protective agents going in, the freezing and the thawing or the, the cooling and the warming. So we believe actually we are going to also have to use some of this resuscitation technology probably after we're done with ours. Okay. Um, Raveen, can we have one question from me? If, if there is time. Uh, sure, sir. Okay. So, Professor Bishop, one thing is, uh, see, I work in the area of heat transfer, and it's always fascinating to understand how bio heat transfer is distinctly different from what you see a materialistic heat transfer that where we know the thermal conductivity, specific heats, and all of this. So, one question that uh, that probably we are safe and we don't have to ask ourselves is, see, when you look at two different organs, once you freeze it and then you dethaw it and then transplant it, how different is it going to perform or function compared to an organ that would have been transplanted without cryo-freezing? 
That's an excellent question, and we just don't know the answer yet. Um, you know, what, what we're trying to do is, and, and many other people, but I will tell you that the concept that you can put a cryoprotective agent into an organ and take it out and the organ will function has been documented since the 1980s. It's, it's a form of stress, no doubt, but the kidney can, you know, uh, recover from the stress and then function normally. What we are basically trying to show in our more recent papers uh, is that when we do vitrification after the cryoprotective agent goes into the organ and comes out, this is really essentially no added stress because you've, you've put enough cryoprotective agent in so that when you cool it, it'll actually vitrify and go into a glassy phase. There, there won't be any crystals there. And then when you rewarm it, if you can do it fast and uniform enough, again, no crystals, no cracking, and you're essentially coming back to the same situation as you had if you were just putting cryoprotective agent in and then taking it back out. So this is what we're working on. And, uh, you know, uh, there is um, good literature out there showing that the organs can function after the cryoprotective agents go in and out. Now we are trying to add to that this added step where you actually go down to the vitrified state and, and return. Sure. So we have just, uh, we are just about the time to finish. So thanks a lot for an excellent uh, keynote presentation. It's something that's completely different. And as for me, it was fascinating because a new area of research. And I think uh, something that the scale at which you people are working is fantastic. It's phenomenal. I'm on 40 researchers in a consortium working on a single problem is something that's commendable. So I... Congratulations to you for this excellent work. And then we look forward to seeing more interesting work from your group. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I hope it uh, gives folks a sense of, you know, uh, what the field of bio heat transfer is turning into. I mean, it's a very exciting time for the field of cryobiology and, and bio heat transfer. Thank you all so much. Thanks a lot. And uh, also let's, uh, on behalf of ISHMT community, again, once again, thank you for agreeing to I give the keynote presentation this late in the evening for you on a Sunday evening. And then we look forward to meeting you in person in the near future. Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Yep. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, Praveen, uh, I take a break and then join back in about 15 minutes. Sure, sir. Okay. So um, I think uh, what well, just one question. See, how do I... How do I actually see the questions? So I just have to look at question answers. Sir, uh, there is question and answer box here on Zoom at uh -huh. the bottom of uh, uh, the Zoom. Like you can, it is beside participants icon. Can you yeah, find I, I did see that, but I think the message was posted on the- yes, Sir, yeah. Actually that question uh, was not received maybe due to some technical glitch. But mm -hmm. I'm parallelly seeing uh, from the portal also. So if any question that uh, that is asked uh, there and if it is not appeared here, I'll forward it on the chat box. Okay, done. So, uh, all right. Probably, are you still recording or it is it has been stopped? Uh, it's recording. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah, you can stop recording. I have a few questions to ask. Uh, 